Hello, I'm Robert Schoen. I'm a volunteer as well as the president of the Austin Steam Train Association. We're making this video today to get you up to speed with what's going on with our steam locomotive, SP-786. This locomotive was uh, built by Alco at the Brooks Works up in New York. Uh, it was used by the Southern Pacific Railroad here in Texas. It was retired in 1956 and given to the city of Austin and put on display in one of the parks in downtown Austin. The Austin Steam Train Association had an agreement with the city of Austin to pull the locomotive out of the park and restore it, which was done right around 1989-1990. The restoration was done at the Westinghouse shops in Round Rock and cost just a little under $1 million. The locomotive was then put into service for the Austin and Texas Central Railroad, which is our operating name, pulling the trains to burn it on what we call the Hill Country Flyer. That started in June of 1992. We ran the locomotive pretty much continuously until 1999, as this was the only locomotive we had. Around 1999, we were having problems with lubrication of the pony truck, which necessitated taking the pony truck off the front of the casting. Once we got the pony truck off to where we could do repairs on the lubrication system of that, we had a much better view of the casting. This is the original casting of 786. We discovered that there was a fatigue fracture in the casting, and you can see that along here, going all the way down here, and it's in a really bad spot because this is right where the frame rails come through. So our original plan was to disassemble the locomotive, take the casting off, take the casting to a specialized welding shop to where under temperature, under control temperature, they could do welding of, of this high grade metal. Uh, and we thought that would probably do the trick. Our cost on that was probably around $350,000 for disassembly, repairing the crack, and putting the locomotive back together. That was plan A. Once we got through disassembling the locomotive and got a much better view of the entire casting, we found multiple, multiple other areas of, uh, of, of defects within the casting itself. In addition to the main crack that we see here in the casting, once we got this whole thing disassembled, we found other places where there were other cracks within the casting itself. There's one down here. There are several right here where the studs go in. And unfortunately, with the multiple defects that we saw, we pretty much rendered this casting unusable and not repairable. So we had to formulate another plan. It would be easy just to go down to Locomotives R Us and buy another casting, and we tried that, but they were fresh out. So we figured the next thing to do was to remake the casting itself. Uh, there were several challenges involved. Uh, we don't have plans for this casting. Apparently there were plans, but the foundry where this casting was made washed away in a flood in Kansas in 1935. So our volunteers got together and, and came up with a detailed set of plans that we could present to another foundry. Then we had to find a foundry to do this, and our friends at, uh, at Strasburg Railroad pointed out Fairmount Foundry up in Pennsylvania, and they took on the job of completely recasting a brand new cylinder saddle for Aston. And while the foundry was making us a brand new casting, we sent the boiler out for repair. It was time for new tubes and new flues, so it went over to Bob Ewell at Historic Machinery Services and also to Holman Boiler in Dallas where the boiler was completely redone, inspected, welded up, new caps, new stay bolts, uh, and retubed to specifications. Once the casting was finished, we sent the casting and the frame also over to Alabama where Scott Lindsay at Steam Operations Corporation and his crew mounted the casting, recreated the frame rails, and put all this back together. So after we got the boiler work done, after we got the front of the engine rebuilt and the brand new casting, which is what this is, put on the frame, we essentially had expended all the funds we had reserved for the steam engine, which is little around $2 million at this point. So we had to bring the components back home. Now, back when we did the first restoration, we had the luxury of a shop there at Westinghouse where we could do all the work indoors and have our contractors come in and do the work. But as you can see, we do not have a shop. Um, we have talked to people about putting this engine back together and, and a lot of these people that do this professionally are very excited about that. But the first question they ask is, tell me about your shop. Well, as you can see, this is our shop, and that's pretty much the end of the conversation. So last year, we took it upon ourselves to design a shop, uh, because if we're gonna get this engine back together and protect it, 
we need a shop to put it in. Uh, this shop is going to be 13,500 square feet. It's going to be right here in the center of the yard, three tracks, 40 ton overhead crane, inspection pit, a drop table for dropping the drivers, and, and plenty of room to work out of the elements. Uh, we are going to start a capital campaign for that as we have the plans, we have the contractor, we have the artist renditions, and we have the site located and we're ready to go. We just need money and we'll talk more about that later. And despite all the pieces sitting out here in the yard, our volunteers have taken a very active role in preserving these pieces against the element. The boiler, which is ready to go essentially, has been coated with a primer and we keep up on that primer to avoid any surface rust. Uh, that was recently reprimered last year uh, by a, a volunteer group from Cisco Information Systems. And over here on the frame, our volunteers also have stripped and painted the frame. It's, it's on its second coat of paint right now, so it's well preserved as well. And during the summer months, our volunteers have come in and taken care of the drivers and the running gear. Uh, the drivers have been stripped, primed, and repainted with, with a double coat. The running gear, like the connecting rods, have been stripped and polished down uh, to their bright metal and coated with a nice coat of Cosmoline, which seems to work well for rust prevention. But despite all the preservation work that we're doing while the equipment sits out here in the elements, there are some things that we think that we can do without a general contractor and without a shop. And that big ticket item is going to be taking the frame and putting the frame on the driving wheels and hooking up the pony truck as well as the trailing truck. That would be a huge milestone for us. But there are some significant challenges that we need to overcome before that can happen. Now to get the frame on the driving wheels, the frame has to rest on some sort of bearing. And this is an example of what we call a driving box. This is the, one of the very old ones that we took off. It's fairly well worn out, so we had to cast new driving boxes, which we're going to use. The driving box fits on the machine portion of the axle. The radiuses have to match, and we have matched our new driving boxes to the existing radiuses of these axles, and they fit very well. They sit on top of this polished metal, and then there's another component underneath that contains the oil feed system, which lubricates this as a bearing. We used to have grease bearings. We're going to go to oil feed bearings, which necessitated the need to make new driving boxes, plus the fact that the old ones were worn out. So to get the frame on the wheels, we need to solve a little measurement conundrum right now. We've talked about the boxes. They're new. We have the same frame with the same dimension here. We have the same wheels with the same radius of the machine surfaces. What we have to figure out very basically is how thick do we make our shoes? Because we're going to need new shoes for this locomotive. Really not worried about the wedges right here, but how thick do we make the shoes? This is the shoe. The frame is here. This sits over the axle itself. And what we need to know is how thick do we make this shoe? Because the thickness or thinness of this shoe sets the critical dimension for the piston travel within the cylinder itself. If we make the shoes, which fits around this piece of metal here, too thick, then that's going to interfere with, with the piston. That piston will come back too far and it will, it will knock out the back cylinder casting. If we make the thickness of the shoe too narrow or too thin, then that's going to allow the piston to go all the way through the cylinder and run in front and crack that. But once we know what the thickness of this shoe is and we can get shoes made, which is no big deal, then we can start again on getting the frame onto the drivers itself. We've done a bunch of measurements over the past two years. We have a lot of conflicting data, which we don't like. So we're going to bring in a consultant that has talked to us before, and we're going to do a detailed measurement of the frame to make sure it's square, to make sure it's in tram, to make sure that the, the brand new castings are put exactly where they were on the old engine, because all of that adds up to the dimensions of the shoes and the wedges, especially the shoes themselves. That's our big holdup right now. So we talk about shoes and wedges. We just talked about the shoe. What's the wedge? The wedge goes on the other side of the driving box. It's an adjustable piece that goes up and down with an adjustment screw. And as you can see here, the thickness, it's thinner here and it becomes thicker here. So this wedge can be, can be rotated up or down to take up some of the slop in the driving boxes. Uh, again, to correct the piston travel and make sure everything is operating correctly. We think these are probably okay. Once again, it's all back to the shoe and how thick do we make it to accommodate our new driving boxes on our old locomotive.
So we've talked about 786, a little bit on its history, a little bit on the major repairs that have been done, a little bit on what we do to preserve those repairs here in the yard, and also talking about what our next steps are, which is getting the frame on the wheels. I want to let you know that we are committed to finishing this project. Uh, we've put many, many volunteer hours and lots of money into it, and I can assure you this is nothing that we're going to walk away from. Uh, but we have challenges to do all of this. You have to remember that our railroad, which is a passenger excursion railroad, is essentially run by volunteers. We're in our 32nd year. Sometime last year, we hauled over our millionth passenger. So 90% of our volunteers' time are spent in operations, either running the train, being our onboard hosts, repairing the train, doing our regularly scheduled maintenance. And what little spare time we have, we can devote to our special restoration projects. 786 is one of them. But the other two that are on top right now are getting our power car finished. And there's some nice videos for you to see on that. And also to finish up the restoration of our own diesel, the 442. Currently, we're leasing a locomotive right now. And that gets the job done. But we'd like to have our own engine back. Because if you rent something or you lease something, you know there's no equity in that. So right now, finishing 442 and the power car, that's number one and two. We still work on 786, but when we get those out of the way, then I think we can move on a lot quicker here. So we appreciate your understanding on why it takes us so long to get things done around here. And we really appreciate you watching the video. Thank you very much.